Hey guys, Mr. Chandler here, and welcome to the Constitution and Bill of Rights uh, notes activity. So for this activity, we have gone down to week eight, unit three, week eight, and right here at the bottom of that is U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights notes. Now you'll note the due date on this assignment says October 16th. That is true. However, if you do it right now, then you don't have to have any chance of it being late. You can have it already done ahead of time. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. So we're gonna click on our activity first. Here we are. We have our directions. It says step one, click the link. Uh, step two says to uh, watch the video below, which I'm making right now. Step three is um, to, while watching the video, take notes. So you're gonna be taking notes along with this video. Uh, step four is to click file, download, and choose either PDF or DOCX as your file type. And step five is to come back to this assignment, click submit, upload file, and submit again. So when I click this link, it will create a document in my Google Docs. We see it right here, titled Copy of US Constitution and Bill of Rights Notes Activity. Of course, we're gonna wanna change the name of that file to just our you know, first and last name, dash, and just like that. Just like we did with the uh, French and Indian War timeline. Now I did it this way because I'm not a big fan of Google Cloud assignments. They always seem to have little issues here and there. Uh, but anyway, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be filling out these notes as we go along um, as you watch the video. So let's go ahead and get started with this. Um, you might find it helpful to have a copy of the Constitution out uh, for yourself. Uh, you can find a copy of the Constitution at the end of your uh, textbook in the, bill, uh, in the uh, appendix. You can also find it by just Googling Constitution. Um, I did that and I went to constituteproject.org, which just has the full text of the Constitution with each article and section um, uh, shareable, which I thought was pretty neat. So. <clears throat> We're going to go ahead and start, and our first thing we have here is the preamble. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. So, the preamble, what is the purpose? Well, I hope you can figure that out. The purpose is to say, here's why we're making a Constitution. There you go, and they list out five reasons. So uh, you have notable items for each, for most of these things. You have a little line there that says notable items. Um, so that is uh, for for this one. I mean, it's kind of your opinion. What do you find notable about all of this? Uh, I find it notable that they start off with "We the People," um, kind of making sure that they're they're identifying right at the beginning. This is for all of us. Thought that was interesting. Uh, also, we've got a word here that I think a lot of you maybe don't know, and that is posterity. Uh, posterity uh, means your descendants, your children and grandchildren and so on. All right, moving on. We have Article 1, Section 1. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. Uh, so the purpose of Article 1 is to lay out how the legislative branch works notable things in it. Um, there's all sorts of things in it that you may find notable. Uh, that, for instance, they have a minimum age of 25. Uh, that you have to um, have been a citizen for seven years. Uh, but it doesn't say you have to have been born a citizen. Just that you shall have to be uh, 25 years old, li uh, live in the United States for seven years, um, and that you have to be an inhabitant of the state where you're chosen um, when, you're, when you're elected. Uh, so for instance, um, when President uh, Bill Clinton uh, ended his, his second term in 2001, uh, he and Hillary Clinton moved to New York City. Uh, and a lot of people are like, wait, why are they moving to New York City? They're from Arkansas, why would they move there? And then a couple of years later, Hillary Clinton ran for U.S. Senate from New York. 
and it's because there was a upcoming vacancy uh, in New York, uh, uh, an upcoming Senate vacancy for New York, and so they had chosen that state specifically to angle for her political career. So that's an example of what we're talking about there. Um, all right, I, I believe this is also probably partly why um, George H.W. Bush moved from Connecticut to Texas, uh, and so on. All right, so anyway, um, some other things that you may find interesting here. Um, it sets up the term limits. Uh, also, that, that was for the House of Representatives, the 25-year-old thing. The Senate, you have to be 30 years old, and you have to have lived in the United States for nine years, or be a citizen for nine years. Um, then it sets up that the vice president breaks ties in the Senate, um, and that he's technically the president of the Senate. So they mention the vice president here. Uh, other uh, things you may find interesting here, um, the, see, our, uh, it says when they um, assemble, they have to assemble just at least once a year, um, and it must be the first Monday in December. So they have, they, Congress could choose to just not meet all year, but they do have to meet at least the first Monday of December, according to the Constitution. Uh, it sets up uh, kind of a lot of the rules of the Senate, but you will note if you read it, the filibuster, where a senator can talk and talk and talk to prevent a vote unless 60 people come together to stop him, is actually not anywhere in here. Um, uh, so another thing we have here um, in Article 1, Section 6, uh, they talk about treason. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, but anyway, we're going to move on and to our next item on our outline is Article 1, Section 8. And the purpose of Article 1, Section 8 is to lay out all of the many powers of Congress. So um, article, no, the Congress shall power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imports, and excises, to pay the debts and provide for common defense, da, 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 to borrow money, to regulate commerce of foreign nations, to establish uniform rule of naturalization, to coin money, regulate the value thereof in foreign coin, fix standard weights and measures, provide for punishment of counterfeiting, to establish post offices, to promote the progress of science and arts, to constitute tribunals inferior to the uh, Supreme Court, to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas, to declare war, to get, raise and support armies, to provide and maintain a navy, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces, provide for the calling forth the militia, to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district as may, by session of particular states, and acceptance of Congress become the seat of government of the United States. Uh, in other words, um, they did not have Washington, D.C. yet, but if they do eventually have such a place, Congress will be in charge of it. Uh, and that's a bunch. That's a whole, whole bunch. And that brings us to the most notable thing in this whole bunch, and that is this last part here, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. In other words, Article 1, Section 8, you've got all these different things. They're saying Congress can do this and this and this and this and this and this, and, this. and then at the end of it, and to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying out these powers. Um, so we call this the necessary and proper clause. It is a loophole that you could drive a semi-truck through. It is a major, major loophole. It is probably, I would argue, absolutely necessary, and it will become a very big source of friction that will help lead to the formation of the nation's first two political parties. So our notable thing for Article 1, Section 8 is the necessary and proper clause. All right, we're gonna skip over Article 9 and 10, uh, or Sections 9 and 10, and move on to Article 2, Section 1. The executive power shall be vested in a President of the United States of America. So, what is the purpose of Article 2? To lay out the executive branch. I keep using the word layout, as in say how it's structured, and what the rules are, and what the powers are. That's what layout means to me. All right, notable items in Article 2. One thing to note 
is you'll note how long Article 1 was. Look at that. In your textbook, that's almost six pages. Article 2 is right at about a page in your textbook. It's much shorter. I call that notable. Uh, it also, you'll note here, he shall hold his office during the term of four years and together with the vice president, chosen for the same term, be elected as follows. You'll note there is no limit on how many terms he can hold, right? So uh, most presidents only served one or two terms. We only had one serve more than that, and that was President Franklin Roosevelt, who served from 1933 to 1945 when he died a couple of months into his fourth term. However, after that, we passed the 26th, 22nd Amendment, which set it at two terms max. But anyway. Other things, uh, it lays out the Electoral College, so that's something notable, Electoral College is there. Um, this paragraph right here is mostly defunct by the 12th Amendment, redid how the Electoral College works. Um, it uh, says that you have to be a natural born citizen or already be a citizen at the time this constitution is adopted. Now that's important because no one old enough to be president would already would have been born a US citizen yet because the United States at this point had only existed for 11 years. So, um, and you have to be 35. So, got to be 25 to be in the House of Representatives. Uh, you got to be 30 to be in the Senate. You got to be 35 to be president. You have to have been a citizen, um, a resident citizen, uh, or I'm sorry, you have to be a citizen of the United States for seven years for the House of Representatives, a citizen of the United States for nine years for the Senate, but to be president, you have to be a natural born citizen or a citizen of the United States when it was founded. So, you know, we could have a vampire president, I guess, eventually. Um, and you have to have lived in the United States for 14 years. That's another big one because um, there's a question for uh, Dwight Eisenhower when he became president. You know, he spent so much of his life overseas as a soldier. They're like, well, well, technically, has he been in the United States for 14 years? And yes, he had. But so it wasn't really a question, but it was something I'm sure someone thought about. Um, now, you'll notice it says natural born citizen. It does not say you have to be born in the United States. We've had uh, just in the past 10 years, two different presidential uh, candidates or, or people running for president, not uh, running for the nomination of their party, at least, who are natural born U.S. citizens, not born in the United States. No, Barack Obama's not one of them. He's born in Hawaii. Don't be silly. Uh, John McCain. John McCain, who ran for president in 2000 and in 2008, uh, was um, actually born in the Panama Canal Zone. Uh, but that was uh, his mother was a U.S. citizen. Um, and technically, that was U.S. soil because it was uh, a U.S. Uh, essentially military base. Uh, and then Ted Cruz was born in Canada. But again, his mother is a U.S. citizen, and that's all it requires to be a U.S. citizen, to be a natural born U.S. citizen, is that your mother's a U.S. citizen and that she lists you as American on your birth certificate. So anyway, I thought that was interesting there. Uh, other things you may find uh, notable, it lists the commander in chief power there. Uh, it talks about his ability to appoint people. And also, by the way, if the Senate is in recess, he can appoint people without their permission. So for instance, when Antonin Scalia died uh, six, almost seven months before the 2016 presidential election, uh, the Senate said that they would not um, confirm uh, President Obama's nominee, Merrick Garland, because it was an election year. So anyway, uh, but uh, he could have um, in, uh, he could have appointed Merrick, uh, the Senate went on recess in June and uh, he could have appointed Merrick Garland then during the recess. However, as soon as the Senate came back from recess, they could then turn around and um, remove him. So, uh, but this actually happened. Uh, President Eisenhower uh, named uh, a, uh, this exact situation happened to Eisenhower. He wanted uh, a Supreme Court just, uh, justice died during an election year. The Democrat controlled Senate refused to um, uh, confirm his appointment until after the election. They went to recess. He went ahead and appointed someone during the recess anyway. Uh, and then I believe that when they came back, they ended up uh, uh, confirming the confir uh, confirming it though. But anyway, 
Uh, and that's it. So not a whole lot in Article 2. But if you thought Article 2 was short, Article 3 is really short. Article 3 doesn't even get a full page in a textbook. Article 3, Section 1, the judicial power of the United States. So this uh, Article 3, its purpose is to lay out the structure of the judicial branch. Um, it says that it shall, uh, uh, what is weird about it is that it is very short. It's very short and it is very not specific as to um, exactly what the Supreme Court can do. So what it says is judicial powers shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution, the laws of the United States and treaties made or which shall be made under their authority to all cases affecting ambassadors and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's saying they have judicial power over all cases. Well, what does that mean exactly, right? It's not actually very clear what they do. But also something very notable, so much so that I gave it its own little thing on your uh, outline here. Article three, what is important about Article three? It actually defines treason. Treason is a word that I think um, in our hot political climate gets thrown around a little bit, um, sometimes maybe a little too willy-nilly. Uh, and so what is the Constitution have to say? The Constitution says, treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. So very clear that treason is making war against the United States or aiding our enemies in war. Now, uh, of course, this is open to interpretation, but still, it's important to understand treason is very, very clearly defined in the Constitution. All right, that brings us on to our next topic of the outline, which is Article 4. Article 4, full faith and credit shall be given to each state, blah, 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 blah. The citizens of each state shall be entitled to a person charged in any state, no person held in service or labor in one state, New states may be admitted. Um, so I think you can see Article 4 is about the states. Article 4's purpose is to le uh, regulate uh, the states. Now, what are some things in here of note? We have the full faith and credit law, uh, clause, which is uh, essentially that um, states have to um, obey uh, the, like, they have to give uh, credence to what other states do. Like, um, it, full faith and credit. So uh, they can't like, say, for instance, Shays Rebellion, right? Where, you know, you have a felon who committed, you know, a straight up terrorism, was able to escape to Vermont and not be held accountable. Uh, they can't do that, right? They have to obey, abide, by, abide by that stuff. Um, we also have uh, the privileges and immunities clause, which is that uh, states have to, um, citizens of a state are entitled to all privileges and immunities um, of citizens for all states. Uh, um, there's also that uh, uh, what we call extradition, where you can't be, um, if you're charged for crime in one state, you can't be like, tried in a different state. They have to try you in the state that you did it in. Uh, we have the fugitive, clay, uh, fugitive slave clause, which states no person held to service or labor in one state, slave, under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein, abolition, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. So, in other words, if slaves run away from the South and escape to the North, they have to be turned over if the owner comes looking for them. This is a fugitive slave clause, one of the three places the Constitution mentions slavery without using the word slavery. Uh, and then article, uh, we have an article uh, four, section three, explains how states, well, it doesn't explain it very clearly, but uh, says um, you know how states are um, added, and specifically that you can't like secede from your own state and start a new state, basically. Um, we also have uh, in here um, that every state has to be a republic. 
uh, and that the United States will um, protect every state from foreign invasion and also protect every state from domestic violence. Um, uh, but it does say on application of legislature or of the executive when the legislature cannot be convened. So for instance, according to Article 4, Section 4, the president could not, I don't know, send troops into a state to fight domestic violence, like quell a riot, for instance, unless Congress approved it first, at least according to the Constitution. All right, moving on, Article 5. Article 5 is real short, look at that. Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments. So Article 5 just says how to create amendments. We see that right there. Article 5, purpose, how to create amendments. Article 6. Article 6, all debts contracted and engagements entered into before adoption of this Constitution shall be as valid against the United States under this Constitution as under the Confederation. This Constitution and the laws of the United States shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be supreme law of the land. The judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state in the country notwithstanding. Senators and representatives before mentioned, members of the state legislatures, all executive judicial officers, both in the United States and in the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution, but no religious test shall be required. So Article 6 is, um, I like to say, is kind of the cleanup article. It just says, and here's everything else. Here's everything else. Um, so the purpose of it is to just kind of, uh, I would say the purpose of Article 6 is to cover anything that they hadn't covered yet, anything important they hadn't covered yet. That's what I would say about Article 6. Uh, now, what are notable things in it? Um, we've got three big notable things in it we really do need to note. Uh, notable thing number one is that it says that all debts and agreements will be honored even if they were made before the Constitution. That's very important because if the United States had borrowed millions and millions of dollars from wealthy creditors during the American Revolution, as they did, and then they create a new Constitution and say, right, psych, we got our own uh, new government now. That was the Articles government. Go talk to them. We're the Constitution government. We're not going to pay all that stuff because that was made by the Articles government. Well, that's a major problem. They cannot have that, right? Um, so, and similarly, if we make a treaty, you know, the Treaty of Paris, 1783, saying, you know, all right, we're gonna, oh, we're, we're gonna respect the borders of Canada, right? And then we're like, ah, that, that was the Articles government, Constitution government, we're gonna take Canada. Uh, we actually do kind of do that. But anyway, point is, Article 6, that first paragraph is saying, no, we're gonna be honoring all the previous stuff. Article 6, paragraph 2, is what we call the Supremacy Clause, which is a Supremacy Clause, if you didn't hear that, which is that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. In other words, the federal government always supersedes the states. Anytime the states and the, and the federal government conflict on an issue that arises under the Constitution, the federal government is above, is supreme. And three, the third thing in there that we have, uh, among other things, is no religious test. So this is our first very clear mention of separation of church and state, that no religious test for holding any public office anywhere in the United States. Any, publicly, any public office, elected or appointed, cannot require you to be any particular religion. So that's very important, and that's in there. All right, and then finally, Article 7, ratification of the conventions of the United States shall be sufficient for the establishment of this Constitution between the states to ratify the same. So ratify the same. Uh, and then we have, oh, George Washington did sign it right there. I always miss, he signed above everyone else. Um, so there we go, all the people. So Article 7 is ratification. That's the purpose. All right, and that's the Constitution, but we're not done. Now we flip over to the next page and we have the Bill of Rights. For each one of these, we're just gonna define the bill, uh, the amendment. We're gonna go through these pretty quickly. I wanna give a few caveats as we get into this. Um, my first little uh, caveat I wanna have here uh, is I made this PowerPoint right here um, in its original form, not exactly the way it looks here. I made this PowerPoint um, when I was teaching eighth grade U.S. history 14 years ago. 
So the cartoons in it, many of those cartoons are outdated and old um, and are referencing things that were happening at the time. Uh, that's why. Don't Please don't take it as me trying to push any agenda either. I did my best to try to show multiple sides to uh, when, when, uh, when applicable on things. Um, sometimes I'm just trying to be funny with it. But anyway, what I have here is in italics, I have the actual text. In bold, I have the gist of it, the basic what it means. Sorry, I forgot to kill the sound there. Um, it is that what's in bold is what I wrote for my eighth grade students. Okay? So many of whom were uh, English as a second language learners. All right? So keep in mind, this is extremely simplified. And it's, while well, you can just write down for your notes, and if it were to come up on the test, you really only need to know the bold. As a citizen, you should really know the whole thing when you can, as much as you can. So let's get into it. The First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. <sighs> in other words, freedom of religion, speech, press, assembly, protest, five things all in the First Amendment. James Madison wrote the entire Bill of Rights by himself. His version that he wrote was 12 amendments. Now, he then gave it to the Congress and they kind of figured it out and got it down to 10. They did not get rid of any of his amendments. They just rearranged them. Now, I don't know for sure how he had them structured, but my guess would be that religion was one, speech and press was, a second, was another one, and assembly and protest was a third one. I'm guessing that Amendment 1 was originally three different amendments. I'm guessing that 6 and 7 were combined into one, I'm guessing that four and five were combined into one, probably. Uh, I'm guessing eight could have been part of six and seven. Nine and 10 also could have been the same thing. Uh, but anyway, point is, his original 12, they kept all 12 of them. They just condensed and moved them around into 10. But anyway, I always kind of thought to myself that they probably made these, uh, the First Amendment, these five different things because um, they could not agree on which of the five should be number one. And so they decided to make all five number one. All right, so we got that. Amendment number two, the freedom to bear arms, which means to own and carry weapons. Um, and my uh, slideshow is not advancing, give me just a second. Okay, I think I got it fixed there, yeah. All right, so amendment number two, freedom to bear arms, that is to own and carry weapons. Now, again, always good to look at the fine print because there's probably been no more controversial amendment than the Second Amendment, and that is because it is very confusingly worded. So, it says, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. I'm gonna move my, uh, face down here so you can see the whole text, I just realized. Um, so some people would read that, the beginning part there, and they would say, a well-regulated militia being necessary security of a free state, that is a, what you call a dependent clause, the right of the people to keep and bear arms should not be infringed, independent clause. Uh, in other words, they would argue that this is saying that the reason the founders, the framers, sorry, uh, included the right to bear arms is because um, at that point in time, our national defense was dependent upon volunteer state militias in which the soldiers typically provided their own guns. Um, now, other people would interpret this differently and say uh, that may have been a consideration, but you see it says security of a free state and so they said what they were thinking of was uh, to prevent the government from enslaving the people. And so they argued that the right to bear arms, uh, yes, it mentions militia, but the real big part here is free state, right? And so that the point of the right to bear arms is for people to protect themselves from the government. A third point of view is, uh, I mean, maybe, but uh, you're not going to really do a whole lot against a predator drone strike, right? Like, 
at this point in time, your AR-15 isn't really going to help you in fighting um, the government. And in that same note, it doesn't say what arms are. We Could arms be guns? Sure. Could they be swords? Certainly. Uh, they probably, obviously they meant guns, but, you know, they didn't foresee, you know, uh, rocket propelled grenade launchers. Should I be able to have an RPG? I mean, the government says no. The government doesn't let me have an RPG. The government doesn't let me have even a fully automatic uh, gun unless I have a special, uh, I, sp I pay a special tax first. Uh, the government doesn't let me have a fully armed tank. The government doesn't let me um, operate a nuclear weapon arsenal. Well, but it says I have the right to bear arms. So where does the restriction come in? Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to look at this. Um, I think that uh, uh, what I think the majority of people would agree is that the founders, the framers, did uh, intend for people to be able to own arms, to own guns, uh, but they probably did not foresee the future, a future in which guns would be very different because in their day, guns, you know, you could fire one shot about every 45 seconds. Um, and they also didn't foresee a future where we would no longer have a well-regulated militia. Um, but they also, they also uh, probably did foresee a future where we would be in um, danger of a tyrannical government. And they probably did intend this for that too. Or maybe not, you know? No one can really say what they did. Uh, I included three different graphics here um, to try to show different points of view uh, and to kind of be balanced on it. So on the left, we have a cartoon that says before and after gun control. On the before side, we have a law abiding citizen and a criminal, um, both armed. And on the next uh, side, we have the criminal still armed, but the law abiding citizen not. The point being that gun control only works if everyone obeys the law. Uh, over here, in the middle, we have uh, data rather than political cartoon. We have data, uh, firearm homicides per 100,000 people. This is probably um, 2008 or 2000. I'm not sure because I probably put this in here in like 2007. So this is probably old data, but you know, it's probably still pretty relevant. So we can see um, the red over here is the United States. Uh, Chile is the next biggest there. And then it's a major drop off before we get to the next one, Turkey, uh, Switzerland, pretty high up there actually. They also, they're, um, they have a pretty lax gun laws. Well, not compared to the United States, but compared to the rest of the world. Uh, and you see it goes on and on and on. And then of course, zero for Japan because they literally don't have guns in Japan. So end of story. Uh, South Korea, same thing. Iceland, same thing. They just, guns don't exist there other than, well, the government, right? Police, uh, police aren't armed typically in those countries, but uh, they have access to guns. Uh, and then um, the military obviously is armed, uh, but the people are not, there's no guns there. So there's no gun violence in Japan or South Korea or Iceland. Uh, this is just data, not pushing a point of view. Um, of course, my favorite way to look at it is obviously they meant that we all have a right to put a, uh, we all have a right to a taxidermy set of bear arms. Um, which my face is covering up, seeing that. So that, of course, I think is what they must have truly meant, right? All right, let's move off of this thorny topic. Uh, amendment number three, no quartering. You don't have to house or feed troops. So pretty big there. Now, of course, again, let's look at the fine print. No soldier shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. In other words, if we're not at war, no quartering. If we are at war, no quartering unless Congress says so. So it's an interesting one. And again, people really rarely think to read the fine print. Speaking of one where you really gotta look at the fine print, amendment number four, no illegal searches. Well, it's a little more than that. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against the unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no, no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So it actually is very, very clear of when and when not law enforcement or the government in general can search or seize 
your person, house, papers, effects. Uh, so very clear. So um, this includes arrest, by the way, right? Arrest is being seized by the government. But to give an example, um, if I'm just walking down the street minding my own business, uh, you know, uh, government Gestapo can't jump out of a car and grab me and throw me in the car, because at least according to the Fourth Amendment, right? That's they can't do that because they have to have a warrant based upon probable cause to arrest me like that, or um, uh, they have to have probable cause. I guess they can. They, um, well, no, they don't have to have the warrant. I'm sorry, but they can't arrest me without the probable cause. So I have to actually be presenting a threat or be, you know, very clearly suspected of a crime. I can't just be arrested for walking down the street unless there's something going on like a curfew or something. So anyway, um, so I thought that was uh, it was uh, pretty interesting. Um, you know, again, I think a lot of people uh, miss the fine print. For instance, it says papers, right? Well, that's documents, right? And so this then in modern times has been interpreted to include things like our data. Well, the government is searching and seizing our data without warrant. So I don't have anything to say to that. Let's move along. All right, uh, amendment number five. There's a whole bunch of stuff in amendment number five. I numbered the four big ones. Number one, criminal justice system has to follow due process with each defendant whatever that means. Due process essentially means they have to follow a set procedure that they follow with everyone, which, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, number two, no double jeopardy, meaning you cannot be charged with the exact same crime twice. Um, now, that is heavily misinterpreted. There is a bad Ashley Judd, um, uh, Tommy Lee Jones movie called Double Jeopardy when I was in high school. Um, I guess I was a senior in high school. Yeah, because it was 2000. Um, uh, called where, where a guy faked his own death and framed his wife for the murder. And then she discovered that he was alive while she was in prison for his murder. And she got out of prison and went to go kill him. Uh, with spoilers, she, she kills him. Uh, and Tommy Lee Jones is like a um, parole officer uh, who basically agrees for her. It's like, oh, yeah, no, you can totally kill him. It's legal because it's double jeopardy. It's like, no, not actually, um, because they, there would be an exception in that case. But the real world exception we can use is O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson almost definitely killed his uh, ex-wife and her boyfriend. However, he was found not guilty in a court of law. And so he can never be charged with that crime ever again, even though he wrote a book in which he explained exactly how he killed them. He titled it, What If I Did Do It? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Now, on the other hand, he was sued by the boyfriend's family um, for a whole lot of money, uh, which he actually didn't pay almost any of. He just declared bankruptcy so he wouldn't have to actually pay it. But they seized a bunch of his property, including sports memorabilia, which he then found someone selling, which he then stole at gunpoint, which is why he's currently in prison for armed robbery. But anyway, point is, is... Um, he was found not guilty of killing those two people, so he can never be charged with it again, even if he writes a book explaining that he totally did it. Number three, you don't have to testify against yourself. You do have to testify against other people, though, um, or you can go to jail, but you don't have to testify against yourself. And finally, eminent domain, which I find extremely notable. It is the only place in the entire Bill of Rights where they are actually kind of taking away your rights. Uh, but this is really important. It says, no private property shall be taken for public use without just compensation. In other words, the government cannot take your property for public use unless they pay you for it. So they can still totally take your property without your permission, without your consent, but only if they pay for it. Uh, and it has to be for public use. So um, where eminent domain usually comes into effect is government wants to build a highway through your land you don't want to sell they will offer you money for it and if you turn it down they'll just take it anyway and give you what they offered uh, and the problem is they don't always necessarily offer what it's actually worth they offer what the current market value of it is which there's a big difference between current market value and what you could actually get for it 
if you're patient, right? So moving on. Amendment six, right to a quick public trial by jury. I'm not gonna get into the, 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 the uh, fine print on this one, um, but that's basically it. Quick public trial, by uh, quick public jury. Now this is specifically in criminal cases. So note for a criminal case, you must have a quick public trial by jury of your peers, by the way. Impartial jury, though it doesn't actually say of your peers. It says, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, yada, yada, yada. Um, so, and then it talks about witnesses and stuff, but that's really the big idea. Um, of course, obviously, for most of our nation's history, there's a segment of our population that did not receive a trial by an impartial jury, but you know, there we go. Uh, I, I always, um, uh, there's a, a t-shirt I really like, I want to get, it says like U.S. Constitution and then it has a little asterisk and in fine print at the bottom it says terms and conditions may apply. All right, member number seven, right to a jury in civil lawsuits. So in civil cases um, uh, where the, the uh, value is more than $20, <laughs> um, you, the default is that you do not have a jury, you just have a judge but you may request a jury. Um, and I think either the person suing or the person being sued, the plaintiff, um, can sue. I'm sorry, the plaintiff is the one suing. Uh, the plaintiff or the defendant may uh, ask for the trial by jury, I'm sorry. I'm not certain about that. Um, I know that the, s I've been called to jury like nine times. I've only served on two juries and the second jury that I served on was a civil lawsuit. And I don't know which side requested a trial by jury, but if it was the uh, plaintiffs, they they were not, that wasn't the right call probably. Um, anyway, moving on. Amendment number eight, a lot of people know, no cruel or unusual punishment, nor excessive fines. So it says, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. So it's actually three things. Everyone focuses on the no cruel and unusual punishment, but you also got excessive bail and excessive fines. Um, and the excessive bail thing is a real big sticking point because a lot of the time you'll see people who've committed non, or accused of, I should say, nonviolent offenses who are uh, given very high bail that they cannot pay. And the thing about it is, if you can't pay your bail, you just sit in jail until your trial, even if you're actually 100% innocent. And that's you know a problem and definitely a class issue. So I added two graphics here, um, basically showing you two different ways that different people interpret cruel or unusual punishment. Some people uh, look to cruel or unusual punishment as literal torture, as we see here in this uh, graphic uh, showing um, someone being put to the wheel by the Spanish Inquisition of the Catholic Church. Um, and here on the right, I'm oh, sorry, my mouse is pointing the wrong way. And here to the right, we see um, other people, some people interpret cruel or unusual punishment to be capital punishment, the death penalty. And so I included a graphic, this is as of 2015, so I've updated this one, of death penalty status around the world. So the dark red countries are countries that use the death penalty. The lighter red, so still pretty dark, but lighter red countries like, you know, um, sorry, like Russia, um, a lot of West Africa here, um, uh, is that New Guinea? I'm not good with that. Uh, so on. Uh, these, uh, uh, Myanmar, uh, these countries do have the death penalty, um, but it has been abolished in practice. That is, they still technically have it, but they have like passed some sort of law banning it for the time being. Um, then uh, the medium dark, uh, countries like we see here with like a lot of South America, oh sorry, my mouse pointer, a lot of South America, um, uh, Kazakhstan, I think is, I think that's Kazakhstan. Uh, some of these countries, they have the death penalty but only for exceptional crimes and that would be for like mass murder, like mass shootings, serial killers, um, terrorism, things like that. Uh, and then um, all of the light countries have just completely abolished the death penalty. So, you know, Australia, New Zealand, 
uh, South Africa um, and a lot of other African countries, um, uh, Madagascar, uh, Turkey, all of Europe pretty much, except for this one little country right there. I think that's Belarus, which is a uh, pretty, pretty much fascist dictatorship right now. Uh, Finland, Norway, Sweden, etc., Iceland, um, Canada, of course, Mexico, uh, etc. They've completely abolished it. Uh, so anyway, that is not, again, saying that that is cruel or unusual punishment, just saying there is a significant part of the population that believes it is, and this kind of shows you where we are in the world, where, you know, with, um, you know, Cuba, right? We got um, Cuba, um, China, right? So it's death penalty, Indonesia, uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, um, India, uh, Sudan, you know, countries like that. Anyway, moving on. Amendment number nine is kind of confusing. Um, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. In other words, remember what James Madison worried about. James Madison, one of the reasons he didn't want a Bill of Rights was he worried that listing out a list of rights that can't be violated would imply that the government can, in, can violate all your other rights. Uh, and it says here in Amendment 9, can't do that. Listing the rights here cannot be used to deny or take away other rights. Now, your, again, your mileage may vary, terms and conditions will apply, right? So the internet isn't in the Constitution because it didn't exist, right? So the government has argued that they're monitoring and cataloging of our internet activity. And it was revealed that over one third of all Americans are having most, if not all, of their online activity registered and recorded by the federal government. Um, they argue, well, the internet's not mentioned, so that doesn't count under the Fourth Amendment. Um, and things like that. So uh, Madison was probably right to worry that that would happen, even though the Ninth Amendment actually prohibits it. All right. And finally, Amendment number 10, powers not given to the national government in the Constitution belong to the states. Oh, I've got to update this slide, don't I? So, uh, in other words, if it's not in the Constitution, it's up to the states. So, for instance, alcohol, not mentioned in the Constitution. So, every state can have whatever drinking laws they want. Um, so, in every state now, the legal drinking age is 21 years old. When I was in high school, Louisiana and Alaska both allowed you to drink if you were 18. Um, eventually, every state went along with it. The federal government uh, basically pressured them into doing it by with, uh, withholding federal highway funding. Now, the map on the right became irrelevant as of the year 2020. But up until the year 2020, uh, these were the states where you could be fired for being gay or transgender, the yellow states. Uh, the red states were states where they actually put it in their constitution that it would always be legal to fire someone for being gay, that the state could never pass a law banning that. However, the Supreme Court ruled that this is um, a violation of the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause, uh, and so it's actually invalid. I am uh, very much looking forward to deleting that graphic from this PowerPoint. All right, and that is the Bill of Rights. There's a whole bunch of more uh, amendments. You're, by the end of the school year, you're gonna learn all but like three of them. So uh, there's 27, so buckle in for that. Um, but I just wanna mention, you know, the Ninth and 10th Amendment are very important because the 10th Amendment very much allows for states to deny you your rights. But the Ninth Amendment says they can't. And so they are going to be, this, this tension between the 9th and the 10th is going to be very important and will be to some extent solved by the 14th Amendment, which we'll learn about in chapter 15. So we got a ways. But um, that's where we're going to stop. That's the whole thing. It's been 49 minutes and 21 seconds and counting. Thank you for sticking around for this very long, very long activity. Uh, but that's, that is it. So I will... Um, I'll see y'all later. Thank you very much. Make sure you get this done. It's due, uh, well, I'm not going to say the due date in the video, so I can use the video next year, but you can see where it's due. Um, when you're done, you go file, download, download as PDF or doc, 
and then you submit it to Canvas and that's how it's turned in. Don't share it with me on Google Docs, just submit it. All right, have a good one.